So B vitamin uh, is a very forgotten area of research because in dairy cow we always assume that the bacteria into the rumen will provide enough to cover the need. But uh, it's a bit of uh, an assumption because they, can, they cover enough to avoid apparition of deficiency symptom, but we are not sure that they, cover, they, they produce enough to uh, fulfill the need and avoid the subclinical deficiency. <laughs> so just to come back uh, to uh, Joe McFadden uh, talk, there are three sources of preformed methyl group. Methionine, which is the key molecule in the, in the methylation pathway, because this methionine will be transformed into S adenosyl methionine, which will be the major donor of methyl group in the body, and choline and betaine, which will be able to provide a uh, methyl group to, for regeneration of homocysteine into methionine. Then you have the novo synthesis of methyl group, which need three important factors, folate, vitamin B12, and a source of one carbon unit. Because folate doesn't provide methyl group. It needs to take one carbon group from the molecule, transform it into methyl group, and then transfer it uh, to homocysteine for regeneration of methionine. So the folate are, is not the provider of one carbon unit. It's act as a trans for the transfer of one carbon unit in this kind of pathway. So there is the methyl uh, folate, which we transfer, which is, which transfer its methyl group through the, under the action of an enzyme, methionine synthase, which is vitamin B12 dependent. It will transfer this methyl group to homocysteine for regeneration of methionine and then Methionine will en could enter the methylation pathway. But to be able to provide this methyl group, one carbon unit should be by, the, by catabolism of other molecules like formate, serine, histidine, and gly glycine. And it could also come from further degradation, betaine, which will provide two more one carbon group to the folate pool. Just to show you the vitamin B12, uh, you will see here in, whoops, no, that's what I want. In green, you have the different form of folate. Tetrahydrofolate, THF, acceptor of one carbon unit. It will accept one carbon unit provided by the catabolism of some molecule as I showed before. And this one carbon unit will be transferred to other molecule in part for the synthesis of uh, the basis for the DNA and RNA synthesis. So it is as essential for the one carbon unit or as, uh, is essential for the synthesis of DNA and RNA and cell replication. And some of these, these one carbon unit will be transfer, uh, transformed into methyl group, which would be tran transferred to homocysteine under the action of the methionine synthase. If there is a lack of vitamin B12, this reaction will stop. And then homocysteine, which is cytotoxic, will be transformed, catabolized into cysteine. And then there will be sent from formation of methyl tetrahydrofolate. So it will cause, uh, and methyl tetrahydrofolate cannot be used by the cell without, uh, the, the only way for the methyl tetrahydrofolate to be used by the cell is to give its methyl group to homocysteine. If this reaction is blocked, then the methyl group and the folate are trapped under the form of tetrahydrofolate. And it will lead to a secondary deficiency in, uh, in folate, and it will block the utilization of folate by the, the, by the cell. So if there is not enough vitamin B12, even if you provide a the, fo the, the folic acid will be transformed into tetrahydrofolate, but after a while, it will accept all one. All four will be uh, trapped under the form of methyl tetrahydrofolate.
So uh, we saw that in uh, most dairy diet use for dairy cow, the supply in preformed methyl group, the supply methionine, choline, and betaine is very low. So we, the question was, is the novo synthesis of methyl group critical for dairy cows? Is it, is it important? And so we, our hypothesis was that if we provide the de novo synthesis of methyl group is coming here, but if we provide more methionine, then we will reduce the need for the novo synthesis of methyl group. And the hypothesis is if folate and vitamin B12 major role are to providing uh, the novo synthesis of methyl group, providing more methionine or providing folic acid and vitamin B12 should have the same effect if the major role is through the methylation pathway. So we designed a study using 24 Paris cows. They received, uh, they were fed since three weeks before calving until 12 weeks of lactation. They were fed a basal diet, low in methionine, and half of them receive a supplement of rumen protected methionine to cover the calculated need of methionine. And <coughs> within each level of methionine uh, diet, dietary methionine, the cow received no vitamin supplementation or a combined supplement of folic acid and vitamin B12. Then we measured the fate of methionine using stable uh, intravenous in infusion of stable isotope. And we infused methionine mark on two carbon, on the methyl group and the last carbon. And we also infuse sodium bicarbonate on the carbon to be, uh, to follow the oxygen. So just to explain the kind of uh, word that you, wording that we are using when we are working with the stable isotope. We talk about methionine entry rate, which at steady state is equal to the methionine irreversible loss rate. The methionine entry rate is the methionine coming absorbed by the cows, plus the methionine provided by the tissue degradation, the normal turnover of protein degradation in the tissue. And it's equal to the methionine used for protein synthesis, which is, again, the, the, the methionine used for uh, the protein turnover of, in tissues and pro, uh, milk protein synthesis, plus the methionine which is catabolized. In this study, there was no effect of the treatment on dry matter intake. So we can just assume that the amount of methionine absorbed was similar for all treatment. So what we saw uh, when we look at uh, the result, if you compare the yellow, you, you look first at the yellow bar, you will see that the f there was more methionine the entry rate of methionine was bigger when the cow were fed rumen protected methionine, which is not surprising we, because we gave them more in the diet and the dry matter intake was similar. So they ate a more cons a diet with more methionine. But what is more surprising is, not surprising, but it was what expected, but we were very happy to see it, that in the cow fed the low methionine diet, the, the methionine entry rate was similar when we gave folic acid and vitamin B12 together. And this is further supported by the fact when we look at the plasma concentration of methionine, which follow exactly the same pattern. So methionine, plasma concentration of methionine was increased when the cow were fed supplementary methionine, but it was also increased when they were fed B vitamin, even if they were eating the low methionine diet. Then we look at the methionine used for protein synthesis in those cows. And then we have two kinds of effects. We had a methionine effect, which if we, you compare, oops, you compare the yellow bar. So the amount of methionine used for protein synthesis was greater when the, they were fed the high methionine diet. But the, uh, there was also a, a vitamin effect and the amount of methionine used for protein synthesis was increased by the vitamin supplement. But 
when we look at the methionine uh, milk protein yield, there was no effect of rumen protected methionine on milk protein yield, but there was an effect of um, the vitamin supplement on milk protein yield, and the effect was numerically greater when they were fed also the rumen protected methionine. So increasing dietary methionine and or increasing folic acid and vitamin B12 supply both increase the amount of methionine available for the dairy cow and both increase the methionine use for protein synthesis. But only the vitamin supplement increase the milk protein yield. So what happened? We look, look at oxidation of, meta, uh, of methionine and we saw that when we were feeding the, the diet with uh, high in methionine, there was more methionine, oxi the oxidation of methionine was greater. And when we fed, they received also the supplement, then it decreased the oxidation of, the, of methionine. And the plasma cysteine, which is a product of a methionine oxidation, follow exactly the same pattern. So it is clear that when we gave vitamin B12 and folic acid, we have an effect on one uh, meta, uh, methyl group supply, but there was something else in action because we also, we, are, we had this effect on milk protein yield. And this could be explained by observations that were made in, by Australian uh, teams uh, comparing different species, including the cows, at period where the milk protein secretion was increased. And they saw that the greatest change in gene expression in mammary tissue of those uh, species uh, is for the folate receptor alpha, which allowed the entry of folate into the cells. They also observed that hormonal stimulation of milk protein synthesis in mammary explant from dairy cow also increased the, the expression of the of this gene, and it also increased a gene, uh, the expression of a gene involved in the DNA synthesis. So folate metabolism by itself, in addition to its role as a provider of mixer group, is also, seems also to play a major role for milk protein synthesis uh, within the mammary epithelial cells. But then what about vitamin B12? Vitamin B12 is, is a coenzyme only for two enzymes, so it's an easy vitamin to study. It's involved in, it's a coenzyme for methionine synthase, which I show you is involved in the remethylation pathway. It's also involved as a coenzyme for methylmalonyl coimutase, which is essential for the entry of propionate into the Krebs cycle and for neoglucogenesis. So we can expect that the demand for Vitamin B12 for this role is important in dairy cow where propionate is a major source of glucose. So in the same study, we infuse also glucose mark on the carbon uh, with a stable isotope and we measure uh, all body rate of occurrence of glucose in those animals and it's mean that it's this, the summation of the glucose coming absorbed by the cow this, the glucose uh, obtained by catabolism of glycogen and gluconeogenesis. In this study, because dry matter intake was similar among the treatment, we assumed that the, the amount of glucose absorbed by the, the animal were similar among treatment. We also assume, but this we did not measure, that the, the, the amount of glucose coming from catabolism of glycogen at this state of gestation was pretty low. So we expect that the, the, if we saw an effect, that it would be due to an effect on gluconeogenesis. And indeed, we saw an effect. We saw uh, that the combined supplement of folic acid and vitamin B12 tend to increase the whole body rate of appearance of glucose by 160 grams per day. And there was no effect on oxidation of glucose. And we saw an increase in milk lactose yield in the same range than the, the whole body rate of appearance of glucose. So it seemed that the glucose that was formed in excess, uh, in excess as compared to control was 
sent for lactose formation, and there was no effect of methionine supplement on glucose kinetics. Because we want really to be sure that the, the, that the vitamin supplement play a role not only on the methylation pathway, but in, in the DNA pathway and uh, the propionate utilization. We gave, uh, we study a group of primitivist cows, although in early lactation, those cows were uh, fed a diet supplemented with rumen protected methionine to cover the need for methyl group. And, with, uh, and they were all fed dietary supplement of folic acid. Half of them were injected uh, weekly by, uh, with saline, and the other group was, uh, was injected with vitamin B12. And what we saw in cow which, uh, which were injected with vitamin B12 is an increase in blood hemoglobin and packed cell volume, which is, was an indication that the vi vitamin B12 supply was so low that it interfered, it blocked folate utilization for the DNA synthesis. And we saw also a decrease in serum methylmalonic acid, which accumulate when the methylmalonic co-imitase is blocked. Then the, the propionate cannot metabolize into succinyl CoA, and methylmalonic acid will be excreted in urine. So we saw, uh, first in serum and then in urine. And then we saw that the, the vitamin B12 injection decreased the concentration of serum methylmalonic acid in, uh, in those animals. Then we repeat another study because the question was, will, if we give folic acid alone, vitamin B12 alone, will we have the same e effect that if we gave the two vitamins together? In this study, we gave to the, the, the cow from four weeks before calving until eight weeks of lactation, supplement, uh, no vitamin supplement, the control in yellow, vitamin B12 alone in blue, folic acid alone in green, and vitamin B12 and folic acid together in brownish. There was no effect on dry matter intake, but there was an effect on, on milk production. Vitamin B12 alone seems to decrease uh, milk production, and folic acid alone or in combination with vitamin B12 increased milk production. Then we look at plasma concentration of glucose. Not surprisingly, uh, plasma glucose was lower in cow fed folic acid alone than in controlled cow because they were eating the same thing, but they were producing more milk. So it's not surprising. But what is more surprising is the effect on the combined, with the combined supplement of vitamin, where milk production was the same than the cow receiving folic acid alone and they were eating the same thing, but plasma glucose was greater for the combined cow receiving the combined supplement of vitamin. And we had the opposite picture when we look at the accumulation of lipid into the liver. So there was more lipid accumulated in the liver of cow fed folic acid alone than in cow fed both vitamin together, probably because they were the, the, the energy supply was larger for those animals due to improved neoglycogenesis. We, uh, taking, uh, we took also liver biopsy of those animals and we observed that there was an increase in the expression of the gene responsible for methylmalonyl coimitase and there was an increased affinity of the enzyme for vitamin B12. So the, it seems that the enzyme used more efficiently vitamin B12. And we saw this effect when we gave the two vitamins together, not when we gave vitamin B12 alone. And this came as a surprise because there is no known involvement of folic acid in the metabolic pathway for the methylmalonyl coimutase. And so we had those results and we had some problem to interpret the result. But then came some publication in Human and Rat, which showed that you need an adequate supply in folate for the transfer of vitamin B12 from the cytosol to the mitochondria. And methionine synthase is present in the cytosol. Methylmalonyl coimutase is present in the mitochondria. So if there is a lack of folic acid, then the, the vitamin B12 cannot, be, cannot enter the mitochondria. 
and then you have a subclinical deficiency at the level of the mitochondria. So again, folate, uh, folate deficiency lead to a secondary deficiency in vitamin B12. We saw before that the secondary deficiency, uh, a deficiency in vitamin B12 lead to a secondary deficiency in folate. So the two vitamins, you need an equilibrium between the two vitamins to have a functional system. And then some colleague of mine at Laval University asked in reproduction asked me if a combined supplement of folic acid and vitamin B12 improve the efficiency of energy metabolism in early lactation. Could it have an effect on reproduction? Reproduction, because we often said that the, the, the success of reproduction is uh, dependent of the duration and uh, the intensity of the negative in energy balance in early lactation. So if we improve the energy balance, the, Energy effi uh, the efficiency of the energy metabolism in early lactation, maybe the, the negative energy balance will be reduced in those cows. So could it have an effect on reproduction? And so they conducted two studies at Laval University. In, in both studies, they used the same experimental protocol. They, uh, they used 24 misparous cows divided in two groups, one receiving intra uh, weekly intramuscular injection of saline and the other, the other half receiving intramuscular injection of folic acid and vitamin B12. They gave these supplements from three weeks before calving until eight weeks of lactation. And in the first study, they observed no effect on dry matter intake. They observed an increase in energy corrected milk and a decrease in BHB concentration in plasma. And the, 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 uh, the sample the follicular fluid in the dominant follicle, and they look at the, the expression of the gene, and this expression of the gene related to follicle differentiation, suggesting, a more, suggesting that in those animals, there will be a more rapid growth of the dominant follicle, but they destroy it. So it's the reason for the second study, in which they did not destroy the dominant follicle. And this time, they observe again no effect on dry matter intake. They, they observe an increase in milk production, a decrease in milk and uh, body weight losses, and, in, and a decrease in plasma concentration of BHB. They saw a decrease in plasma uh, non esterified fatty acid, but only during the first three weeks of lactation. They observe an increase in the number of large follicles, an increase in the size of the dominant follicle and a decrease in the number of days in milk at the first insemination, but it was not statistically significant because the, of the reduced number of animals in the study. So we conducted, we repeated the same protocol, but this time uh, on farm. The problem with on farm trial, we were not able to measure dry matter intake, but we saw a decrease in milk fat content and increase in milk protein content in those animals. So the fat, the fat to protein ratio in milk was lower in the cow that received the, the vitamin supplement. We also observed that the losses in body weight and body condition score were reduced in when the cow received both vitamins. So we assume that it reflects uh, an improvement in the energy balance in, during the first week of lactation. And in cow second lactation and or more, we saw a decrease in calving problem by 50%. Don't ask me any question why we can't explain this effect. So we, we don't know why we saw this positive effect. And we saw a decrease in the interval between calving and the first insemination as in the previous study, but this time due to the number of animals in the study, it was significant. So what I would like to show you is the variation among herbs. Sorry. We have the, the fat to protein ratio in the uh, 15 herbs, and you can see that in most cases, the fat to protein ratio was decreased by the, the vitamin supplement in orange, except in two herbs where there was a, sm a, a small increase or no increase at all. 
uh, in response to the supplementation. The same thing happened when we look at the estimated body weight losses. In most cases, we saw a decrease in body weight losses with the vitamin supplement, except in a few herds where there was no, no response or even an increase in body weight losses. This kind of variation in response to vitamin supplementation we saw also when we look at the result that we obtained in experimental farm. So in four out of six studies, we saw an increase in milk production. And I, when I see, I, I show you milk production, but it was also an increase in milk protein yield uh, in four of the studies. In Gagnon et al, we saw no effect on milk production. There was only an effect on energy corrected milk, and in Duplessis et al, there was no effect at all. So out trying to explain why we saw this effect, we look at the status of the, the vitamin of these animals, and we assume that the plasma concentration will be a good uh, indicator of the vitamin status of the animal, because we are working with water-soluble vitamins. So, and we saw that among the studies, there was few uh, some variation. In some cases, folate are, whoop. In, some in some cases, folate are pretty high, whereas in some cases, they are low. And the same for, for uh, vitamin B12. In some experiments, they were, that concentration was low, whereas in some others, it was higher. And not surprisingly, when the status in both vitamin is low, like in this study, the response to the vitamin supplementation is high. Whereas when folate is high and vitamin B12 is low or the opposite, then the response is lower. And when both status is low, there is no positive effect when giving a vitamin supplement. It was not significant, but still a decrease, and they were not producing more. So this is not surprising. If the cow has enough vitamin, mm -hmm. it's not surprising that there is no positive, major positive response to a supplementation. The problem is that we have a lot of problem to estimate the status of the animal uh, without taking blood sample. <coughs> and just to show you, to continue, to just continue on this, we, we observed that in primiparous cow, vitamin B12 in plasma is, in serum in this case, is often very low as compared to multiparous cow. And when we look at the response to folic acid supplementation, folic acid alone, then we saw that in multiparous cow, there was a linear increase in milk production when we, with the increasing doses of uh, folic acid. There was no effect on dry matter intake. There was an increase in milk protein yield. And it was due to an increase in milk casein yield. There was no effect on milk whey protein yield. And there was a decrease in milk non-protein nitrogen, indicating that there was an improved efficiency of protein metabolism. Nitrogen was more efficiently used for protein synthesis when the cow received the, vitamin, the folic acid supplement but it was observed in cow with a high status in vitamin B12. In primparous cow, the one that had the low status in vitamin B12, there was no effect of the dietary supplementation on milk protein. There was even a, s a slight decrease in milk production during the first week of lactation in those animals. So based on our studies, it seems that when plasma concentration of vitamin B12 is lower, than 200 picogram per ml, then the utilization of folic acid is impaired. Whereas when plasma concentration of folate is lower than 12 nanogram per ml, the transfer of vitamin B12 from cytosol to mitochondria for the utilization of pro, uh, for, uh, for the methyl melanin coemitase is also impaired. So it seems that there is a status uh, over uh, which um, control the response to the vitamin supplementation. But we had a study where plasma and plasma vitamin B12 and plasma folate both were over the threshold. And 
not surprisingly, we saw no effect on dry matter intake or milk production or milk protein in yield, but we still saw a decrease in losses of body weight and body condition score in early lactation. So we tried, we tried, we want to understand why this happened. And so we conducted a study using its Paris car, but later in lactation from uh, 45 to 75 days in milk, and they were weekly injected with folic acid and vitamin B12 or saline for four weeks. And then during the last week, we restricted their feed intake at 75% of their ad libitum intake the week before to, uh, in order to create a negative energy balance. And, and those cows, uh, as I said previously, they, they were plasma concentration of folate and vitamin B12 were over the, fo the threshold that we think that control the response to the supplement. And we, con we conducted uh, an intravenous glucose tolerance test in those animals. There was uh, no effect on milk production. There was a small decrease in milk fat content. It was significant, but small uh, during the restricted period. Uh, during the the intravenous glucose tolerance test, there was no difference in the rate of cle cle clearance rate of, of glucose in those animals, but there was a difference in the clearance rate of insulin and the, the peak height. It was lower when the animal received the vitamin. It seems that vitamin, the vitamin supplement in those animals reduce the resistance to insulin. The cow need less insulin to have the same clearance rate of glucose. But we are still looking to, to find the exact place where the vitamin, <coughs> in which pathway they are acting to change the, the response, uh, the tissue uh, sensitivity to insulin. So it seems that increasing in cow with uh, increasing folate and vitamin B12 supply, B12 supply change energy partitioning among tissues. And the major response that we observe in the different trial could be some rise like that. We saw no effect on dry matter intake, but we saw an increase in milk production and milk protein yield without or with a reduce, uh, reducing losses in body weight and body condition score or we saw no effect on dry matter intake, milk production, or milk, milk component yield, but we still saw a reduction in body weight and body condition score losses during early lactation. And the response to the supplementation seems to be driven by the vitamin status of the animal. So in order to see if we can manage to change the vitamin status of the animal by changing the diet. We conducted a survey across Canada and United States. We sampled cows in the first part of lactation in five, five areas in, in Canada and five areas in the United States, just to try to have the largest differences in diet composition. And what we saw when we look at the in, we study, we conducted this, the statistic on that. We saw that plasma folate concentration is positively associated with the concentra dietary concentration of non-fiber carbohydrate and negatively associated with dietary concentration of fiber. And vitamin B12 is exactly the opposite. So does it mean that it's not possible to optimize the folate status without uh, deterioration of the vitamin B12? or the opposite. But then we look at the, what we observe in the different area, uh, and we saw that in uh, Northwest USA, which was in this case, Oregon and Washington states, and the cows had the low, in the study, the cow in this area had the lowest concentration of plasma folate, always over the threshold of 12, and the highest concentration of vitamin B12 always over the threshold of 200 picogram per ml. In, Calif in California, plasma vitamin B12 was generally correct, but plasma folate were under the threshold. Whereas in Quebec and New York State, uh, 
we observed the opposite. Plasma vitamin B12 was lower than plasma folate. And I have to say that in this study, Canada just decided to take New York, sta New York State to Canada because there was only one farm in New York State and they were very close to the border, so we decided that we will annex New York State to Canada in this study. So if we look now at the nutrient composition of those diets, you will see if we, we look at the plasma folate, you will see that, and we compare Northwest USA with California, we see that the fiber concent dietary concentration in Quebec and uh, Northwest USA were pretty similar, but it was lower than in California. Now, if we look at vitamin B12, you can see that it was non-fiber non carbohydrates were pretty similar between California and Northwest USA, and as were the concentration. And, but in Quebec and New York, it was higher. So it seemed that we can find and ad adjust the diet in order to optimize the supplement. Of, we still need to work more on this topic because it's a very raw data, but it seems that it is possible to have a diet, to, to balance a diet in order to be able to improve the status of the animal in both vitamins, even if they are positively and negatively correlated to, this, to the <coughs> same nutrient. So a, in summary, a combined supplement of folic acid and vitamin B12 alter energy and protein metabolism in early lactation. It increased the, the supply in methyl group, but this cannot explain all the effect that we observe in production and met the metabolic effect also. The response to the supplementation seems to be driven by the vitamin status of the animal, and the vitamin status can be at least, is at least dependent of uh, partly to diet composition. So, and just a last uh, slide on the last project that we are just completing. And I present those data because I, I hope that Dr. Hansen's presentation will give us the explanation for this observation. In this study, the cow received uh, this, the combined supplement of vitamin B12 and folic acid during the last three weeks of lactation. And we observed that the body weight of the cow was larger when the, the cow received the supplement. And we don't know if it's uh, due to an effect on transfer of vitamin to the calf, which improve energy and protein metabolism in those animals, or if, it, or if it was an epigenetic effect because we changed methylation of DNA and gene expression. So it's only a very crude, raw observation. So thank you. Do you have questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very nice presentation. Um, questions from the audience? Yep, Jose and then Joe. Just uh, curious, uh, the, the uh, 15 or 16 hertz that you did the experiment with injectable folate, did you collect milk fatty acids to see if the change in uh, milk fat was because the preformed fatty acids that were less? No, no. Okay. And it, it's a shame because we conducted the study maybe uh, two, one year too early because now at uh, Valacta, the, the DHI agency, they can provide the, pro the fatty acid profile, but in this case it was not available. So, unfortunately, no. Just another quick question. Can I speculate that maybe the Maybe the protein effect in the mammary gland may be related to the milk effect. Can it be driven by increased insulin sensitivity and activation of mTOR pathway for protein synthesis? It could be, could be, yeah. But I never, we never look at that.
Here, hi. Um, when you talk about the reduction in uh, milk fat, um, could you see a correlation between, like, if we increase uh, the amount that it was increased in milk yield, could compensate the reduction in milk fat, and we could keep the same uh, the same level of, of quota in Canada for the producers? Because you said there is a reduction in milk fat. Um, but if you have, uh, but if this reduction was compensated by milk yield, uh, this could, uh, this is still could benefit us to keep the quota for the producers in Canada. So this milk fat wouldn't really affect uh, the quota level. Yeah, I don't think that it will have an effect on the quota because the effect was observed only during the very first week of lactation. Probably because we reduce the amount of preformed fatty acids into milk, passing to milk, it doesn't seem to affect the synthesis of milk fatty acid. So, and the effect was restricted during the first week during the negative energy balance. So, on uh, the old herd, on the bull tank milk, I don't think that the effect could be so huge. But we, you will have a health effect on the cows. So I think it will equilibrate the loss, the slight loss in milk, in milk fat. Um, my question's about uh, serine. So we did a study where we, I basically infused serine and we didn't see any change in phosphatidylcholines or, or methionine. I mean, have you considered, uh, we didn't do that study in the transition cow, but have you thought about serine and is there any, is it worth exploring further? We look at, uh, in most of those studies, we measure amino acid in plasma and change over the time. And we, rare, we never saw any changes in serine and glycine, for example. But they are involved, so their major role is for protein synthesis and not for, the, the proportion of serine and glycine used for methyl donors is very low as compared to the amount of methyl of serine and glycine used for protein synthesis. So I think it's the reason why we can't see any difference there. We saw a difference on homocysteine, for example, because it's directly involved in the methionine. We saw an effect on cysteine when we measure total cysteine, not when we measure only free cysteine, but when we measure total cysteine in plasma, we can see an effect. But on serine and glycine and histidine, we never saw. But what we never measure is formate, which is probably a good source of one carbon unit in ruminant. There is so many things that we did not measure. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Gerard? All right. Thank you very much for the presentation.